In the last lecture, we learned that temperature scale is defined in relation to the phase of the matter. Remember how 0 degree and 100 degree in Celsius scale are defined with respect to the freezing and boiling point of ice and water respectively? It is a common knowledge that when we heat an object, the object's temperature increases. Vice versa, when we cool an object down, its temperature decreases. Now when we heat up or cool down an object, we are actually transferring energy to and through the object. As I said in the last lecture, Temperature does provide a measure on the so-called internal energy of the system. In layman term, temperature is a measure of how energetic an object or a matter is. There are three phases of matter we commonly know. Solid, liquid, and gas. Think of an H2O for example. H2O appears in three different phases we are familiar with. The solid phase, which we call ice. The liquid phase, which we call water and the gas phase, which we call steam. Though we have different names for each of them, though each behave in totally different manner, water can change its shape while ice cannot, for example. There are one at the same thing at molecular level, that is H2O, two hydrogen atom and one oxygen atom combined together. What distinguishes them are two things. First is the temperature. Ice has lower temperature than water, and water has lower temperature than steam. Temperature is a microscopic quantity. It is microscopic in the sense that it is obvious enough for our naked senses to detect. What is not detected by our naked senses is the microscopic quantity of the object, just as the strength of the H2O molecular bonds that form them. In ice, each H2O molecule binds strongly to its neighbor to form a rigid structure. In water, the H2O molecules are no longer bonded so strongly. Yes, they are still bonded, but the distance between each molecule and its neighbors so further apart that they are only bonded weakly. This results in water being able to change its shape flexibly. When it comes to steam, the molecules are freely moving. The molecule is no longer bonded to its neighbor. Going from ice to steam, the H2O molecules are getting more and more energetic in accordance with the increase in temperature. It is because the H2O molecules are getting more energetic that they are able to break the molecular bonds. This illustration does show that there is a direct relationship between heat and temperature, supply more heat and temperature increases as I said earlier, and between temperature and the phase of the matter. Steam is of higher temperature than ice for example. By logic, this implies that there is a direct relationship between heat and the phase of the matter. Indeed, in agreement with our daily experience, if we heat a block of ice, it melts to become water, and if we heat the water up some more, it evaporates to become steam. This particular lecture ponders on this relationship how much heat is required to melt such and such ice to become such and such water, for example. Now we shall start by looking at how heat affects the temperature and or the phase of the matter typically. What we are about to go through is called phase transition diagram. Since I only meant this for illustration, that is to say I only want us to appreciate the typical trend or characteristic in a phase transition diagram of certain matter, I will not draw this diagram up to scale. I will use H2O as an example in this illustration since we are all very familiar with ice, water, and steam. The diagram is formed by two axes, the temperature on the vertical or y-axis and the amount of heat required or released on the horizontal or x-axis. Heat is denoted using capital Q. It is a form of energy, so the SI unit of heat is the same as the SI unit of energy, namely Joule. The arrows indicate direction of increasing quantity. Hence, going up means increase in temperature, while going right means the extra amount of heat is required. So let's say we start with 1 kg of ice at minus 10 degrees Celsius. In Kelvin scale, that is equal to 263 Kelvin. At this stage, I would like to clarify that by temperature, I'm referring to the average temperature of the object as a whole. I need to say this because in reality, when we heat an object up, as what we are going to do with these blocks of ice soon, the temperature at different parts of the object will vary. Obviously, those nearer to the heat source will be hotter than those further away from the source. But if we assume that any heat supplied to an object is immediately distributed over the object, then from the zeroth law of thermodynamics, we shall conclude that all parts of the object will share the same average temperature. Consequently, all parts of the object will also increase their temperature by the same rate. Since this is just the beginning, we have no heat supply whatsoever yet, so Q is still zero. But once we start heating the ice up, Q increases and we are moving down the line of increasing temperature and heat supply. Until we reach the melting point of ice, 
0 degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. So at this stage, we have 1 kg of ice at 0 degrees Celsius. Further supply of heat will definitely cause the ice to melt into water. Now this is the part you need to pay attention. During this stage, there is no increase in average temperature of the system. The heat supply is used to break the molecular bonds from solid to liquid phase, resulting in this mixture of ice and water, both at 273 Kelvin or 0 degrees Celsius. So by the end of this stage, we have 1 kg of water at 0 degrees Celsius. Please note that phase change does not cause loss in mass. If we start with 1 kg of ice, we should end up with 1 kg of water at this stage, unless there is a leak in the container. Now we heat the water some more. Temperature increases further for obvious reason, until it reaches the boiling point of 373 Kelvin or 100 degrees Celsius. So at this stage, we have 1 kg of water at 100 degrees Celsius. Further supply of heat will cause water to evaporate into water vapor or steam. Similar to the melting of ice, the evaporation of water involves no increase in temperature. The heat supply is required to break the already vertically bonded H2O molecules in the water into freely moving H2O molecules in the steam. At the end of this stage, we have 1 kg of steam at 100 degrees Celsius. And if we heat this steam some more, it will definitely increase the temperature of the steam as expected. In conclusion, from solid to gas, simple methods typically follow this trend when it is heated up. Furthermore, this diagram is reversible, meaning that methods also go through the same trend line when it is cooled down, except that it is going in the opposite direction toward decreasing temperature and negative heat. Negative heat implies that heat is being extracted from the object. We see this phenomena happening on water on daily basis. Is this happening on, say, iron as well? Well, indeed it is, but of course it happens in different temperature regime. Iron at room temperature is solid. Have you ever seen iron at liquid phase? I bet you have, when you visit metal foundry or workshop before. Can iron be in gaseous state? Well, sure it can. You can find iron gas at the core of our sun or other stars, for instance. We need extremely high temperature to convert iron into its gaseous state. But I would also like to warn you that this trend line is not true for all physical matter. Wood, for instance, we don't find wood in liquid or gaseous state, do we? Generally, complex organic polymer do not follow this sort of trend line. The answer to why matter behaves differently lies in the different chemical structure that form the matter. Coming back to our main discussion of this phase transition diagram, what we have been through is the qualitative description of how an object would increase its temperature and change its phase under heat but we have not gone through the quantitative description yet. I didn't tell you yet how much heat is required for the temperature to increase by such and such or how much heat is required to melt such and such amount of ice. This is where we are heading in the next slide. But before we get into that, I would like you guys to pay attention to the two different characteristics in this phase transition diagram. First, there is this function where the temperature increases linearly as heat is being supplied. In these stages, the matter does not undergo any phase change. The equation that describes these stages is given by Q equal to M times C times delta T. Q refers to the amount of heat supplied to the system. This amount of heat will have to be proportional to, first of all, by how much the temperature has increased, denoted by delta T in this equation. Obviously, we require more heat to increase the temperature of an object by, say, 50 degrees, then it is required to increase the temperature of the same object by, say, 10 degrees. Do note that because the equation asks for change in temperature instead of the absolute temperature of the object itself, it does not matter whether to work in degrees Celsius or Kelvin. The change of temperature will be the same in both temperature scales. Do be careful, however, if you are dealing with equation that asks for absolute temperature, such as the ideal gas equation we will study in the next chapter. If absolute temperature is involved, we always have to work in Kelvin scale, which is the SI unit of temperature. Take note that delta T may not always be positive. It is positive if the final temperature is higher than the initial temperature, meaning that the object heats up. But if the object cools down, final temperature will be lower than initial temperature, and hence delta T will be negative. Negative delta T implies that Q will be negative, as the other two quantities M and C, as we will see soon, are never going to be negative. As I briefly mentioned just now, negative Q implies heat extraction. 
when an object is cooling down, heat is being extracted away from it. Secondly, Q will have to be proportional to the quantity of the matter, which is given in terms of the mass of the spoken matter. For example, it definitely takes much more heat to increase the temperature of say 10 kg of water by 10 degrees than it is required to increase the temperature of 1 kg of water by the same 10 degrees. The last quantity, denoted by C here, reflects the kind of material the object is made of. For example, metal and water heats up at different rate. Experience taught us that it is easier and much faster to heat up 1 kg aluminium than 1 kg of water by the same degree. This difference is reflected in the so-called heat capacity of the object. An object with lower heat capacity requires less energy to heat up by the same degree as object with higher heat capacity. So we expect aluminium to have lower heat capacity than water does. Indeed, if we look at the table of heat capacity of various materials commonly found around us, aluminium has lower heat capacity than water does. Even water and ice, though both are made of the same H2O molecules, possess different heat capacity. Ice heats up and cools down faster than water. Furthermore, if 4200 joules of heat has to be supplied to increase the temperature of 1 kg of water by 1 degree, the same 4200 joules of heat has to be extracted to decrease the temperature of 1 kg of water by 1 degree. Heat capacity will never be a negative quantity because if it is negative, it means that heat would have to be extracted for the temperature of the object to increase. It is like saying, we have to cool down the object to increase its temperature which of course doesn't make any sense at all. Thus, we have Q equal to M times C times delta T for the portion of changing temperature in the phase transition diagram. The other portions of the diagram involve no change in temperature. This portion has to be governed by different equation, Q equal to M times L. Q and M carry the same physical meaning as before. Because these portions involve no change of temperature, there is no more delta T in the equation. Meanwhile, L, which is called latent heat, carries the same physical meaning as heat capacity in the previous equation. If heat capacity refers to how easy or difficult it is for a material to heat up under certain amount of heat, latent heat refers to how easy or difficult it is for a material to change its phase under certain amount of heat. It is a quantity characteristic of the material. Now, there are two stages where an object undergoes phase change without change in temperature. Those are melting or freezing states and evaporation or condensation states. So naturally, there are two types of latent heat, namely latent heat of fusion, which refers to, if you are talking about H2O, the amount of heat required to melt per kilogram ice into water, or heat extracted to freeze per kilogram water into ice, and the latent heat of vaporization, which refers to the amount of heat required to evaporate per kilogram water into steam, or heat extracted to condensate per kilogram steam into water. The latent heats of some of the more common materials are provided in this table. For the same type of material, latent heat of vaporization is always higher than latent heat of fusion. That means, in the context of water, it takes much more energy to evaporate 1 kg of water than to melt 1 kg of ice. Now I will close this chapter with a simple example of how this equation can be applied to solve problem. The problem is, how much energy is required to change a 40 gram ice cube at minus 10 degrees Celsius to steam at 110 degrees Celsius? The necessary heat capacities and latent heats are provided here. By the way, you do not need to memorize any of this constant. This will be provided in the test exam. I will give you some time to solve this problem. To solve this problem, we should be aware that from ice to steam, the object at hand goes through five stages, namely from ice at minus 10 to ice at 0 degrees Celsius, ice at 0 to water at 0 degrees Celsius, water at 0 to water at 100 degrees Celsius, water at 100 to steam at 100 degrees Celsius, and finally steam from 100 to 110 degrees Celsius. Okay, if you found me speaking too fast, please rewind the video. These five stages represent five terms in the computation of the heat required. Each term comes from one stage. We then apply the proper equation, either Q equal to M times C times delta T, or Q equal to M times L, to compute each stage. The 40 gram mass, which remains constant throughout, is the common factor which can be taken out of the individual terms. Substituting the numbers will give us the answer, 0 0.12 megajoule. Now I said this is a simple problem because it is a direct application of the formula. Just plug the numbers into the equation and you will get the answer. I can assure you that exam question will not be this simple. 
it will relate to the more complex nature of everyday life experience. For instance, when we want to make Milo Peng or cold Milo, what we do is to prepare hot Milo first. If we use cold water, the Milo powder is not going to dissolve properly and add blocks of ice into the hot Milo to cool it down. In accordance to zero law of thermodynamics, heat will have to flow out of the hot Milo to the ice. In the process, the Milo cools down and the ice heats up until the Milo ice system reaches thermal equilibrium whereby no more heat flows and the temperature of the ice, most if not all of them are now melted inside the Milo, is the same as the temperature of the Milo. Depending on the amount of Milo versus the amount of ice involved, this thermal equilibrium varies. Obviously, the more ice poured in, the lower the final temperature is going to be. Now, I may ask you to compute this final temperature.